to really start by, I thought just to, you know, a lot of these things are about context, so tell you a bit about my background. Um, I transitioned in the early to mid-1980s, and, um, and in that time I remember going to see a psychiatrist who was quite well known at the time, and I went to um, St. Bernard's Hospital in Ealing, and I grew up in the 50s when it was called the Hanwell Lunatic Asylum, that was the actual name that was on a wall, and I'm, I'm hoping that you're all too young to remember that. Can you imagine how pathologizing that must have been if somebody's had a breakdown or something? So I remember going there, and his room, I'm sorry, I, I've spent the whole coffee break scratching out he and she after making this presentation. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it will slip through, I'm sorry. And, and, it, and, it, and I thought, oh my God, this confirms it, I'm mad. You know, I mean, that was the really the thinking of the day. And prior to that, to my shame, I voluntarily had aversion therapy. I actually allowed them to give it to me. You know, it's a case of hypnosis with various medication and the idea being that, in my case, you know, male to female, that if you put a dress on, you'd be sick. And the psychiatrist said to me, well, back, you know, how is it? I said, I've spoiled a lot of dresses. You know, <laughs> it didn't work. And patently, the idea that you suppress somebody's gender or their sexuality was lunatic to me, even, you know, back, uh, back then. So, um, and I remember at the GIC, and the person who was running it in those days is long gone, and I, I was married, I still am married, and um, they wanted us to get divorced before I could be referred for surgery. And I had said, and we said, well look, we'll do it, but we will invite the press, because two weeks later we would go down the aisle, both wearing white dresses, you know, because I legally, of course, could still marry anyway. I think they thought perhaps they didn't want the publicity. <laughs> And nor did I, I would never have called their bluff. Um, and, um, and, and to this day, I mean, my partner and I celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary in September. And on May the 22nd, we're going to be in the Supreme Court, the House of Lords, challenging the pension ruling. Because I refuse to annul my marriage, I'm denied a GRC, which means HMRC can um, tell me I'm legally male, I'm not entitled to a pension in 60. So uh, we've gone, we've lost three times so far. We are not going to lose, because even if this one goes the wrong way, we'll be in Europe. It's just outrageous that politicians can tell me whether I should be married or not. And, um, and, and the GRA is very flawed, I'm afraid, at some levels. I mean, it's a big step forward, but we're getting to that. So I'll move on from that, because um, anyway, so... The um, in, marriage was important to me and still is. And I transitioned, you know, within four or five years I had a breakdown. So this amazing woman that I live with has been with me through the whole journey. So why would I want to get divorced? Anyway, I'm really come to talk about that. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, I think it's useful in context, isn't it, to understand how we get treated when we don't fit whatever people think norm is. Um, and I'm doing a doctorate at the moment on the clinical treatment of gender identities. I think it's vitally important. I'm in practice, um, I now see, I never did for years, because I, I trained in 19... I've got a friend here, where's Diane? Uh, she and I trained together back in, when was it, 1989? We began a very torturous course, didn't we? But it was good, actually. I then went on to train as a Gestalt therapist, and, um, and now I'm a little more integrative these days than I used to be. Um, and in my practice at the minute, I think I've got um, in total, because I don't see everybody every week, about 12 people where gender identity is kind of in the field. And six of those are children under the age of 16. And interestingly, at the moment, it would change on a week by week basis, five of them um, identify as trans boys, and, and one is trans female, you know. And the public always think, of course, that the skewing is the other way around. But, if I spoke to you in a month's time, I dare say it would be very different again. You know, it goes up and down. So, and by the way, I do want to explain that slide before everybody screams about all these things like gender dysphoria. Trans. It's purely search engine optimization. It's the only reason those words are there, because like it or not, they are the most searched for words. So it's the only reason it's there. Just to get out of the way before you start firing darts at me from the back. Uh, it's the only reason it's there. So, I think for me, um, get this to work. Yeah, um, the question really is what is psychotherapy and what is counselling? 
we've heard a lot about from clinicians. Let me say what it isn't, as far as I'm concerned. It shouldn't, it's not a diagnostic vehicle to take on with people's lives at, at any level. I don't care whether it's gender or anything else. And one of the problems, I think, with clinicians, and I'll include myself, is that we sometimes get obsessed with papers and manuals and we search and we miss the clients. Who has walked in to my therapy <coughs> room and why have they come? You know, diagnosis for me is only relevant in the sense that it informs me how I might work with somebody. You know, if they've got a bit of a borderline process or whatever. It's not about then putting them in a box and saying, well, that's, um, um, you know, um, where we're at, you know, DSM and ICD-10, I very rarely look at, they're there, I don't need them really. It's useful to have that knowledge. And why do they come to us in the first place? I mean, especially with gender identity, maybe they're uncertain about a way forward, um, maybe they know they want to transition but feel daunted, uh, maybe be begun transition and there are lots of challenges, or they might just be stressed because of it all. We don't know. And here for me is the crucial thing, the work is not about the gender identity. The work is about empowering people to make healthy decisions, empowering people to be clear about where they are. So we work with the neurosis, you know, gender identity is not a neurosis. <laughs> it, can, it possibly could emerge from it, but it doesn't define somebody, or at least it shouldn't do when we're in the therapy room, and everybody's guilty of it, you know, I am as well, and I have to check myself out. So why is, um, why is um, psychotherapy underemployed, or at least I think it is, um, and there's a mix here with psychiatry, and I don't know how many <coughs> psychiatrists have we got in the room, I'm, not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm with you, where are you, how many? <laughs> None. None. Oh no, can you put your hand up higher than that? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it just one person? Oh, God bless you, we'll get you a support group. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's tough when you're on your own, isn't it? I know. <laughs> uh, I let me tell you, I did a psychiatric placement for six months, and I had huge respect after doing that for what psychiatrists do when it's when it working well. And um, I'm competing with an electric saw back then. Um, the fact is, though, and this is kind, this is not a criticism, but knowing what we know now know, we've, it's been depathologized. Psychiatry would not be leading the process. It, it simply wouldn't. It's not a criticism of psychiatry as such, but knowing what we now now know, it's not a mental illness. Psychiatry would not be leading. So why don't we have more multidisciplinary teams? We really do need to utilise all the resources and all the strengths that we've got. It's not just about psychotherapy being the only thing that works, or psychiatry. Psychiatrists are very well equipped and better than I am and everyone else in this room, apart from um, my friend there, is um, to, you know, recognise psychosis and so on. Well, we need to do that, but, you know, we're not looking at gender as a mental health issue. And I remember, um, Terry, who you'll hear from this afternoon, and I were on the Royal College uh, co uh, Commission that rewrote standards of care. Or, well, we didn't really rewrite, but we thought we did. And, um, you know, we, things changed a bit. And a psychiatrist <laughs> actually said, and wasn't directing it at me, well, if they're a therapist, of course they shouldn't be transgender. Well, uh, you know, it's like, would you say to somebody who's uh, wheelchair bound, well of course, you know, you shouldn't be working with disability. I mean, it's just nonsense. And um, I think the implication was that I wouldn't be able to put my counter-transference aside and my experience would impact on, on the process. And, you know, am I really going to encourage people to go through a process where, you know, I did actually reflect to, to in that time that, you know, I had a breakdown, I had a suicide attempt, I went bankrupt. Oh, why didn't you do it? You know, I mean, the notion, <laughs> the notion that you would do that is so absurd. But I think it's a kind of a fear of the unknown, I think. But when, when we talk about clinical treatment, but we sometimes restrict it to an outside-in approach. You know, we've got all this knowledge, and this poor person comes in knowing less than we do, and we're working with them. Whereas if we really use phenomenology, you know, it's not to use jargon, but really allow for the client's experience and have an inside-out approach, 
we meet them. You know, they actually feel that we're meeting them. And, um, and, and I do think um, working with this notion of the what is, I mean, I've got Gestalt background, so I'm a bit of a here and now person. But nevertheless, whatever therapy approach is used, it really needs to respect that person. You know, what's in the room? Not what I've read about in a book. What's in the room? And Tina yesterday, for those of you who were with us, talked about unhelpful therapy. It wasn't unhelpful therapy. What she was describing in her research is there are a lot of people out there who are inept. Call a spade a spade. You know, if you're judging somebody, you're inept. And you shouldn't be doing the work. Or at least go and get supervision and retrain. You know what I mean? It's like not good enough. And people in this field, our clients that present with any issue around gender, already feel marginalised. So there we are, understanding therapists, and we're pathologising them the minute they walk in the room. Not good enough. Anyway, get a bit passionate about this sometimes. Excuse me. So, um, you've heard a lot about trans. I hope the, is it in the right place? <laughs> I did see that. I saw the gingerbread person, by the way, on there. It's a good point though, isn't it? I think it was Virginia Prince, wasn't it, first said that gender's between my ears and not between my legs. Um, or at least I think it was her. But what's been interesting, I think, is this emergence, in, uh, probably in the 1990s, of a trans identity. Um, and there are, I think we have to be careful as well that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some people that have a very firm binary view of gender. And it's about allowing for you know, everybody really, it's not about saying one's better than the other. But what I do, uh, I like to think of, and I'm going to talk through a little bit of a case study in a minute, which has kind of really formed how I work a lot, is encourage people to explore the gender spectrum. You know, and I think we've heard about it with non-binary and so on. It's not always about alpha male and, you know, ultra feminine female. There's a lot in between. And I don't think we people get permission enough to look at that and what it means for them. Uh, and the therapeutic process for me, I've already said it should be about the uh, identity and not neurosis. And I, 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 uh, the identity itself is not a neurosis. And I found this online, isn't this perfect? This is somebody's vision of the gender spectrum. G.I. Joe, so we know it's American anyway, that would be in Barbie. And, and there are 12 of them. <laughs> when we get, I don't know, maybe sort of right wing group with 12 disciples, I've no idea, but you know. Um, <laughs> and it, uh, I'd say that as a Christian, by the way, it's fine. And, you know, but interestingly, isn't it? Like, somebody's, it's, a good, it's a good stab, isn't it? But what do we really know about the gender spectrum? And I think, you know, I, I, I was really engaged with Meg's presentation about non-binary and you know how we can um, make sure we allow for people to you know you know self-determine it's not just about the alpha male or Dorothy on the yellow brick road to stay with the Wizard of Oz theme that Dominic's brought in um, it is much more than that and um, I um, I've, I've found and I'll, I'll just talk through it now very briefly and I've changed all the details and the names and everything. But what happened was very interesting for me a few years ago. Um, a person came to see me, and this person, you know, you know appeared and um, identified themselves as male. But they said um, they felt that they wanted to be female, but it would be impossible because of their physiology and various other factors that you know, I did a, a bit too specific to mention. And the goal of therapy was, can you help me to come to terms with where I'm at now so that I can survive, because it's really hard. And, uh, you know, because I know that being a female is impossible. And what we did is, uh, we, you know, we picked through a lot of childhood stuff and so on. And straight away, it wasn't really about the gender identity as such. And what happened over a period of time is, um, you know, we. To, and I say we because it was a kind of co-created thing, took some steps along the gender path. Um, you know, and the person never experienced any form of cross-gender expression at that time, so just going to a safe support group, for example, was a big step. And moved on and then had something that got, got in shape physically, because I'm you know, worried about the way. 
And to cut a long story short, ultimately this person transitioned and had SRS, sexual reassignment surgery, or gender confirmation surgery, whatever. Um, and, and, I f I, I, and it was really interesting, and I think what happened, and I'm not saying that I very cleverly, you know, went with this process, it evolved, was that because this huge step, which it seemed impossible, was broken down into bite-sized chunks and could have stopped anywhere. I think that's the key. You know, you can be non-binary. You can, you can express yourself as, in this person's case as a woman at the weekend if that's enough or whatever. And each time they went along, and at the end, they felt so good about themselves. They said, "Listen, you know, I really need to do this. I don't care what the problems are." And as far as I know, they're living a really happy life. You know, we stop playing God. And, and support somebody where they are. It, it's a very, very different process. And, um, you know, that for me was a, a very big lesson that I'd learned at that point. Um, so, for me, you know, exploring whatever this spectrum is, is something I think that we should, in, in my view, encourage people to do. And I always say, and the reason I've called it journey in transition is, I think when people think of a transition as a change of gender, it's a massive thing, isn't it? It's too much. Whereas I say, look, you have to take these steps. It's a journey. And who knows where the journey stops? You stop off when you like the look of the station, or where you feel comfortable. Can you say some more about the steps? Say again? Say some more about the steps. Well, I think it's, you know, there's no prescription for it. But as I said, if you think of the two extremes of what society throws up as male and female, who knows where you might feel okay? But you won't know if you never ever go out at the weekend in the opposite gender, lie to people in a gender clinic, have surgery, you know, when you've changed in the toilet, and that, that doesn't happen often, but it has. Now, it may still be right for somebody, but how do they know what's right? But I don't think we support them enough to say it's okay not being fixed. It's okay to want to see where you want to stop on the journey. But I wanted just to talk briefly about um, cultural pressure, and it's interesting, um, Dominic mentioned um, Domenico started the, and I, went, I met him, I was, I think I was in transition at the time when he started doing his work. But, you know, um, we live in a multicultural society and, and it's good to just be aware of people's culture and what pressures there might be. I find it horribly, horribly macabre and interesting that countries we've liberated are now more homophobic and more transphobic than they were before we liberated them. I mean, it's just, isn't that, isn't that awful? And, and at the same time, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me that that happens. And one of the problems is, and I met, there was a guy came over and he ran safe houses in Iraq a few years ago. And of course, I think most people in the room know that in Iran, sex reassignment surgery is very common because the Ayatollah, when he was um, running the country, um, decreed a fatwa, you know, a, a decree that actually somebody changing their gender was not anti-Islamic, there was nothing in the Quran. However, they had to have surgery before they could express themselves. So they didn't really quite get it, but at least people had an opportunity. And in Iraq, where uh, gay men, and, and particularly and lesbian women, were being persecuted, what a lot of them did was cross the border and one of them would, would change gender. Now, I don't know what other problems that would have given them, you know, to try and, you know, if your sexuality is that you're attracted to a same-sex relationship, you then changing, you know, it's not a same-sex relationship anymore. But my heart just bleeds for people that feel they have to do that, you know. Uh, it's awful. Um, so, and I think, um, I like that, it's uh, David Moyes at the Etihad Stadium in Manchester, apparently. And it's a football analogy that most people won't get, but anyway. Um, it's, um, um, that's interesting actually, just to digress. When I was growing up, I did this classic thing that a lot of people in my position used to do, and go into this quite type of masculinity, you know. And I did boxing and all sorts of very mad things. And I was always very good at football. 
and I was on Chelsea's books for a time. And um, I had a business partner who was a Chelsea season ticket holder, and it destroyed him when he found out the I was ago. Anyway, and um, I was at Old Trafford because I, I was um, I lived in Manchester for a long time. And I was sitting at a table, and a woman with two children sat down, and she said, um, um, "Is your partner not like football?" Because I. I'm married, I wear a wedding ring, and clearly I didn't think, you know, a football club was the best place to start describing gender variance, so I just ignored that. And she said, oh, my husband hates it, but I've got a season ticket here, I, I come with the kids every fortnight. And I was thinking, you know, and it was like, why well, am I worried about what, what I enjoy? You know, this the stereotypical stuff that men and women do. First time I went in a pub with a group of women, I was the only one drinking a glass of wine or drinking pints of lager. You know, it's, it's, it, where, where does that take us? It's, um, it's crazy. But, um, but I do think, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, I, having said what I said about the spectrum, we have to recognise also that there are some people with a very clear binary gender identity, and that's fine too. I think it's still worth kind of you know, talking about it and what it means. But we do need to make sure that we that we recognise that, and um, and that we don't, you know, ignore it because we know so much again. And you know, well, I went to a conference and they were talking about non-binary and gender spectrums. Have you looked at that? Well, they may maybe want to, but they're not necessarily going to. And I think when we talk about clinical treatment, we want that. Um, the, don't trust me at all, do you, with time? I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, working with children is interesting because there are very strict protocols in place, you know, really, and, they're, and they're quite largely based, you know, if you, if you talk to people like um, Norman Spack, who was the guy who I've met in Boston who administers puberty blockers, and I know we've got people from the Tavistock here that now do that, now they'll, they'll know about this as well. The protocols are, are quite strict and they're largely based on what the you know the standards of care are about you know the experience from a very early age and so on and um, you know um, and we know a lot don't change their minds in adolescence and we know that some do you know that's just a reality so we can sit here being very clear about making sure that you know young people get medical treatment and the reality is that it's a very hard call for the clinicians. Um, for me, the results that I've seen with young people on blockers are staggeringly good. But, you know, that doesn't mean I don't think we can just say, you know, that they turn up at the GPs and you'll be given sweets that, you know, are affecting bodily changes. Um, and I think, you know, we're all in danger a bit of simplifying it. And I have an, uh, one of my clients, a young person, is very autistic, very it's extreme autism. And with children anyway, I didn't say it, I tend to work with the families. I mean, I might have one-to-one -one time with the, um, um, you know, with the child. But, um, you know, the family is always involved. And it's, it's, it's really persistent, it's really interesting to see somebody who's just totally, they don't actually question their gender at all. It just is. It just is, it's like, look, we don't need to talk about that. Um, so it's a challenge, isn't it? How do we get all of that right? How do we make sure that we really see people as they are? And I want to just before um, I close, um, just talk about another person that I worked with. And I think, I don't know that I've used the phrase, but it's really important, I think, as a therapist, to not have an investment in the outcome, other than our investment is in the well-being of the person. <laughs> Whatever we may think, it's we have to really make sure we we get busy with it if there's something going on and we but we, we put it to one side. And I worked with somebody a while back and it's quite specific so I'm going to be very general. But um, I'll call the person Jane. I identified as female uh, at the time and then said maybe they were non-binary. And um, it turned out that um, Jane, uh, between the ages of 10 and 14, was subject to very, very severe sexual violence. And it was systematic and it went on for a long time. Now, really I thought my job was not saying well, where you should be with your gender, but clearly to work with that so that they started to be, they were traumatised. And I actually did some EMDR, 
um, licensed to be a eye movement desensitisation reprocessing practitioner. I don't use it with gender specifically, but this person had been traumatised. And what happened was, um, unlike my other client, this person decided that actually maybe changing gender wasn't right for them. But again, if you start with an agenda that says it is or it isn't, I don't think we'd have got to that point. And for them, it was clearly right that they didn't. They were trying to escape from the pain that the body connected with. You know, so it, it's so subtle the work that we all do in this field because we can have our ideas about freedom and so on, and that's right. Ultimately, the client has a right of self-determination, but we have a duty to try and help them be emotionally robust and clear about where they're at. That's our job. It's not to, you know, be an, an expert in diagnosis. I mean, Dominic tells me off a bit because I often say when I do training, look, you don't have to be an expert in gender. You have to be a good psychotherapist. And that's a bit too simplistic, but there is an element of truth in that, as you heard from Tina's examples. So, um, you know, um, they often want, uh, want the answer. We can't always, we don't know it ourselves, but they do deep down. That's the bit I trust. Deep down, I trust that my clients will make good decisions when I've helped them to be emotionally strong. And I just want to leave you with it, because this is very interesting with the binary gender, and it also gives me, oh, um, I didn't mention that when I didn't show that slide, this is Jade, who a lot of you have seen on the internet at the moment lovely kid and such a great example of a child who's happy in their skin. It's on YouTube if you haven't seen it. I always get a bit uncomfortable, mind you, when children are dragged through the media by their parents. Not sure about that. I got involved in that a while back um, with, um, with, a, with a certain case and, and I got really attacked on Breakfast News one morning, you know, by some of you should remain nameless, but she was in Strictly Come Dancing. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, and, oh, I got the question, you know, you're there as a clinician, and I get this, so how was it for you? And the eyelids were flashing, you know, and I thought, you wouldn't say that to somebody else. How was it for you? I remember going to a dinner party, because, you know, whenever you change gender, back in when I did it in the 70s, or the 80s rather, got to make yourself even older. You know, we got invited to dinner parties because it was, let's see what the tranny looks like, you know what I mean? And that was, that was what was going on. And this woman um, said to my partner, I got a bit drunk and said, I can understand you staying together, but what's it like not having sex? And I said, it's really interesting, nobody ever asks me that. Because you become a non-sexualised person when you change gender, in the eyes of a lot of people. And she said, oh, no, I haven't. So how was it for you? So I haven't told her to mix sex and travel. The evening ended quite early because <laughs> um, I wasn't about to discuss my sexuality with her. I don't know why I'm so private. I mean, I'd been outed all over the place by then. It didn't really matter. And um, you know, talking about the scripts, I just thought I'd mention I've written a book. But the, the, the point in there's coming out next month. It's only a draft cover, and I've called it "Become the Hero or Shiro You Were Born to Be." And I, and I've acknowledged Maya Angelou with that because um, she devised the term. Sheroes, because you know, heroin is a, a derivative of, of hero. I know after today I've got to rethink it. <laughs> it's got to be become the person who we're born to be. But actually, you know, I, I do identify with the binary gender, and I don't want to impose that on my clients, but nevertheless, that's where I'm at, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that, and that's fine. So, how good is that? It's just gone that the timing's immaculate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, listen, thank you so much for being so attentive. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.